God condemn people from other faiths who are living good lives to hell? Over to you, uh, Nick. Thank you. Great questions. Okay, I think I've been asked, um, well, welcome everybody. It's so lovely to see all these people. Some I know, and some I don't know. Welcome, I've just seen Waibo as well. And uh, we've got three people from the USA now, which is lovely. And everybody else, thank you for uh, inviting me to this. I've been asked, Magnus has asked me to give you a quick testimony. Can I just check, am I understandable? Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, yes, great, right. okay. So in a nutshell, I was brought up in a Greek Orthodox culture, being Greek Cypriot, um, but from the age of 14, I had this intense desire to know who God was. I thought, why pray to somebody who doesn't answer you back? You know, it's a bit like someone says they love you, but you never experience their love. And so that got me onto a spiritual quest for truth. I sadly met, uh, or unfortunately met a spiritualist lady across, across from my school who introduced me to really spiritualism, which is occultism, if you like, magic and or, or contacting demons. Although I didn't realize they were demons, I thought they were my loved ones. And that sucked me in because I wanted spiritual reality, as most people do. You know, go into a very traditional Orthodox church where it smells and bells, kiss the icons, kiss the priest's hands, and but the rest of the week you can do what you want. I mean, that probably rings some bells for some of us who have, who have been brought up in a very traditional background. But for the spiritualist movement, you know, there was supernatural power and, I, and that made me hungry. But it really was after many years of fearing God, I knew I would go to hell if I died and I longed to be pure. And, but the more I tried to be pure in terms of being a vegetarian, meditation, etc., the more godless and wicked I became. But I had an intense awareness that God was so holy and I was so wicked that if I died, I'd go to hell. And that's what petrified me for many years. And it really was through reading the Bible and the resurrection that brought me to a living faith. And so that's a very brief story of how I became a Christian. And then just to bring it up today, I started um, very late in life. I was, a, I was a reject at school, so to speak, left with, left with no proper exams. I had to return back when I was 21 and said to my parents, give me one more chance. I'll, I want to become a doctor. And really by an act of God's grace, I got into medical school very late in life. And, um, and I got converted about eight, several months before I started. So that was a real blessing. And um, here I am now as a, I'm, I'm a palliative medicine consultant in Luton, married to Savart, as my wife and one of my children, Naomi, who's 18. We've got four kids and um, we love Jesus. So that's what I'm here to talk about today. <laughs> Is that enough? Okay. <laughs> Um, I don't want to talk about myself too much. I want to talk about the Lord. Let me answer those two questions, that, which are very, very pertinent, I think. The first one was about, um, do I believe in Jesus? Is that right? How, that's the son of God. And I think if I had to answer that question, because it's a very pertinent question, and it really uh, it asks, how do we know Jesus is who we claim to be? And um, as an illustration, I was um, st street preaching on Saturday, and, um, I, and there was a Jehovah's Witness standing by listening to it all. And unfortunately, I start off gentle, but I end up becoming a rock violer at the end. And um, I still quite haven't worked out how to be gentle to Jehovah's Witnesses. But um, the question I posed to this person, and he, wasn't, he couldn't answer, I said, what one thing can God, that God does that no human being can ever do, even the prophets? And it, it really flummoxed him. He didn't know how to answer it. So I had to answer it for him. I said, the one thing that only God can do, that no human can do, is forgive sin. Isn't that true? And he didn't like that answer. But so if I had to say, how do I know Jesus is God? I think that really the key thing is there are three attributes of God that no human being has. Number one, that Jesus himself forgave sin on his own authority. And you have to read the Gospels to begin to see who Jesus is. Number two, Jesus had power over all demonic forces. They bowed down and worshipped him. No demons bowed down to the apostles. No demons worshipped the apostles. And thirdly, Jesus had power over all nature. So those three attributes, which you will find from reading the Gospels, lead you to one conclusion. Jesus must be not only fully human, but fully divine. I hope that helps that question. And in answer to the second one, um, you know, how can a God of love uh, lead people to hell of other religions? And whilst it's a very fair question, I think it's a little bit of a lopsided question because 
people only assume God is love. Rightly so, he is, but it's like an off balance. God is also justice, and the justice must be balanced with love. See, God cannot just forgive and let us off for the consequences of our actions unless the sentence is paid. It's a little bit like Hitler standing for the judge, guilty of all the millions of Jewish people that he murdered and the rest. And the judge says to him, you know what? I'm a forgiving judge. I'm a merciful judge. I'm going to let you off scot-free. Well, you could say the judge was merciful, but was the judge just? I think not. And so in the same way, we cannot expect God just to forgive us because we're ignorant. The Bible makes it very clear that every man and woman is guilty before God because we know who God is. But we choose to love a lie. And therefore, we, God doesn't condemn us. We, in a sense, condemn ourselves because we refuse to believe the good news of Christ Jesus. And let me just give you a very relevant uh, reference. Jonah 2, um, verse 8. So Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. And he says this, and I think that the new NIV gives it quite a nice rendering. It says this, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. In other words, if we choose to rebel and live our own life and choose our own religion, we are rejecting God's love and mercy through his son, the Lord Jesus. I hope, well, that's a short answer. I hope it's given you some food, food for thought. Okay, Magnus. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much, Nick. If you want to uh, continue now with it, do you want okay. to run first? Or should yep. we chat? Let's. Um, if you could chat. So I'm going to. We're going to look at Acts chapter 16 today. I'm just wondering if, because it's 40 verses, I think it'd be very helpful to to actually read through it. Okay. So the reason I put that there is there are in fact some notes that I've produced. But I tend to give the notes after my after my Bible study, because otherwise people, you, you, there's no surprise element if I give you the notes beforehand. So you will get the notes sent to you. Is that OK? And this maps actually in the notes. And the reason I'm showing it is it just shows you Paul's missionary journey, what's called a second, the second missionary journey, which in fact begins really in sort of uh, the end of chapter 15 and, and the beginning of chapter 16. So you can you can see that for yourself. Um, so th thanks for that, Magnus. We can take that away for a second. So I think it would be really helpful if actually we read the whole passage. And I think because there's 40 verses, well, can we have four volunteers to do 10 verses each? It doesn't matter what version you're using of the Bible. I'm using the NIV just because I thought most people have the NIV. I tend for personal study used in New King James, but it doesn't matter which one you use. Stick to one and memorize it from one, one translation. If you try and memorize it from different translations you get confused so can we have four volunteers who have got loud voices to um go do 10 verses each of acts chapter 16. volunteers okay nigel i'll, I'll do one okay well, why don't you start I'll smart do you did the first go 10 on. i'll do another one thank you and we have two more 10 volunteers. verses yeah there's 40 verses uh, Naomi will do it as well. <laughs> okay, so do 10 and 10 and, so, and someone else does. And Peter, Peter's volunteered for the, to be the, the fourth one. Fantastic. Okay, go ahead, Savat. Okay. Now it happened, it's verse 16, isn't it? Yeah, chapter 16, the whole, yes, the whole yeah. chapter. Oh, the beginning, oh, sorry, I was, I was doing verse chapter 16. 16 so. verses okay. Chapter 16, verses 1 to 16. Yeah, Acts 16, okay. verses 1 to 40. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia, Phry 
Phrygia yeah. Yeah. and the region of Galatia. They were forbidden by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Um, now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samaria. <laughs> and the next day it came from Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a foremost of the ci oh, foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who right. worshipped God. Sorry. <laughs> the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptised, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Um, now it happened, as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl, possessed with the spirit of Divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that her, the hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Oh, I didn't this And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Thank you, Naomi. Next person. Oops, I did 21. Okay, <laughs> then, then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stri stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet to the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all of the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing the prisoner's doors open, supposed the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud, loud voice, do yourself no harm, for we're all here. And then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what am I must do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And Paul took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. And when he had brought them out into the house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have sent to you to let you go and therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. 
And now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates. And they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then he came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. And so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for reading that. So we we'll keep our Bibles open and we're going to look at that in detail. I'll endeavor to break it down. You know, in some ways, as a sort of introduction, I think the book of Acts is a little bit like Genesis of the, of the Old Testament, if you like. It's the Genesis of the New Testament. What do I mean by that? Well, what the first commandment that God gave to Adam was to go forth and multiply, wasn't it? And to have dominion over the world, to conquer the world. And that was repeated with Noah, wasn't it? When after the flood. In the same way, the Lord Jesus commanded his disciples and each one of us, if we're Christians, we are followers of Jesus. We're not apostles. That's, they're unique. Christ's apostles are unique. But he calls his church to go into the world, doesn't he? And conquer it, not with a sword, like Islam, but with the gospel of peace. Now, isn't that ext extraordinary, isn't it? So if you like, the Great Commission at the end of Matthew 28, go into the world. And if you like, conquer the world with the gospel. And that's really what the church is all about. So I've been entitled this, How Does God's Church Grow? And we've come to a very important shift in the book of Acts. Because before that, just to put it in context, as you know, Paul had finished his first missionary journey, which was pr primarily around Turkey, which is what's called uh, Asia Minor. So all those places that we showed on the map was predominantly Turkey, what's called modern day Turkey, like Derby and Lystra, etc. Antioch in Turkey. There's two Antiochs, by the way, one in Syria and one in Turkey, in case you didn't realize that. Um, and there's this conflict. So they've come back from Jerusalem from the, Jewish, the Jerusalem Council with instructions for the church. And there's this conflict between Paul and Barnabas because of Mark, who deserted them. And so because of this rift, they go separate ways. As you know, Barnabas goes to Cyprus, which is where my parents are from. And, and Paul endeavors to go back through Turkey again, if you like, on his repeat journey. And that's where we now come in into chapter 16 of Acts. So we will see that the church grows because of the Holy Spirit. And this book, this chapter really focuses on the work of the Holy Spirit. Because the greatest danger, I believe, for us as individual Christians and as a church, that body is, where do we go? How do we know what God's will is, both individually in terms of spiritual growth, where do we go? Where are we called? How does the church grow? How do we make a church more effective? Now, these are big questions. I don't endeavor to answer them all today in a short study, but they're important theological questions. How do we make the church grow? Do we need to put more musicians in, have it more contemporary, make it trendy and jazzy? You know what I mean, don't you? You've all heard these sort of arguments before. Whilst there are, it's important to try to contemporize how we praise God, but we must never modify the word of God, yeah? So I've managed to divide this chapter, which we're gonna look at, into three divisions, okay? So we're looking at verse one to 10. As I said, you'll get the notes, so don't worry, all right? Magnus will send it out to all of you if you, if you want the notes. We're looking at verse one to 10, and I've called that led by the Spirit. Then we're gonna look at verses 11 to 34, conversion by the spirit and the last bit verses 35 to 40 fellowship by the spirit does that make sense so led by the spirit verses 1 to 10 verses 11 to 34 conversion by the spirit and then verses 35 to 40 fellowship by the spirit <clears throat> and it's always uh, helpful when you're studying the bible to see if you can try and divide it into three parts Three is normally the easiest way to do it, because number one, people remember it if you're teaching it. And um, 
it, it helps you to grasp the essentials of, of the passage. So let's look at verses 1 to 10, shall we? And please stop me if you're not sure about something. Just interject and ask me, okay? It's not going to be a monologue, by the way. Uh, I want you to partake of this. So let's look at verses 1 to 10, which is called Led by the Spirit. Magnus, can you put that slide up again for a second, just so people can orientate themselves? So as you can see, and as I said, this will be actually in the handout. If you can see, um, this is what's called a secondary missionary journey. So they came from Jerusalem, and uh, in a sense, they're, they're going back from sort of Antioch and Tarsus, which is Turkey, and then Derby and Lystra, which is, if you read chapter 15 and before, that's where they had their ministry there. And if you go right to the north, you can see Macedonia. Can you see that? Troas, Neapolis, Philippi. Yeah. So that's what's going to happen in this chapter. Thanks, Magnus. We can take that away now. Okay. So let's just look at, I'm going to try and unpack some essential elements in verses 1 to 10. Now, the first bit we notice is that he mentions Timothy. Okay, who was half, basically his mum was Jewish and his dad was Greek. Now, here's a question. Why did Paul circumcise Timothy? But bearing in mind, if you read the book of Galatians, Paul was venomously against those, those circumcisions of the flesh. So is Paul contradicting himself when he circumcised Timothy? Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Why did he circumcise him? It's a, it's a bit like um, last week when we were looking at the Council of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, what, what's happening really is circumcision and all the other things, they've actually been done away with. Yes. But I think as Calvin and lots of others point out, the body is dead, but it's not quite buried. And he did this. Because he, because he was half and half, half Greek, half Jewish, he did it to, uh, to keep the, the, Jew, the believing Jews around there happy. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Greg. Um, he said he was not compromising his theology because he was Jewish, um, because his mum was Jewish. In order for him to be an effective witness to fellow Jews, by him being circumcised, it would have identified him as a Jew because a Jew was not considered a Jew, as you know, if you weren't circumcised. So Paul did do it in order to, if you like, be all things to all men. He's not compromising the gospel. And the difference between this and Galatians is that they try to make Gentiles circumcised. So there's the distinction. He was a Jew, Timothy, and it would have hindered his ministry amongst fellow Jews had he not been circumcised. Does that make sense? So yes. it's, an, it's an important, and you, you're right, Greg, in how you explain that. Thank you for that. So, so, that, so this is this account here with Timothy. And then look at verse 4. It says, as they travelled from town to town, they delivered the decision reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. What, was those, what were those decisions, by the way? You have to look in the, in the passage just before, by the way, if you're not sure. And if someone can read, perhaps... Just to help you, on oh, 15 verse 29. They should know this because we did it last week. <laughs> well, it's a good reminder. So often if I ask a question, the actual the answer, the Bible gives you the answer. It's not an esoteric question. Can someone read it out for me, please? Verse yeah. 29. <clears throat> yes, you both. That's my friend as well, by the way, in Bournemouth. Hello, doctor. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Thank you, Weibo. You do well to avoid these things. Yes. So what he's doing there, because it was, it was a, a distinction, because these were predominantly Jewish people who were saved. Now the Gentiles are getting saved. And it was an instruction from the, from, if you like, from the church council um, to, to abstain from certain things that would cause offence and be unholy. And I think the sexual morality may have to do with more pagan, idolatrous prostitution. Um, here's an important question for you. Why is doctrine important for the church today? Surely it's just experience we need as Christians, isn't it? But doesn't doctrine present a framework within which we can speak and develop a Christian philosophy, if you like. I think you're, you're right, David, 
because if you look at verse 5, it says the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in number. You see, without doctrine, there's nothing to hold on to, is there? No. And it's so important that preachers and teachers preach doctrine, which is God's word in the scriptures, not what you think it means. And the greatest need for the church today is faithful biblical exposition. Christian people do not grow on experience. Amen. But you have to be careful. We need experientialism of the word of God. Well, if we have God, the Holy Spirit in us, it's experiential, isn't it? Do you agree? Isn't yeah. love experiential? Yeah. So we mustn't denigrate experience at the cost of just, we need both. Because the truth, truth always affirms experience. Experience of itself never determines truth. Yes? Yeah. And so these people were fed the word of God by the apostles. So it's apostolic doctrine that we need. And the only way you're going to get doctrine is through studying the Bible. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? Yep. Yes. yes. And it actually tells us the church grew both spiritually and numerically. Make sense? Yeah. So that's why we need that, you see. Okay. So now we go on to this very interesting, looking at verses six to 10 now. Um, here's a very, very interesting question. And it actually will perhaps make us answer some of the frustrations we may have individually, perhaps seeking God's will. Why did the Holy Spirit forbid Paul from going back into Turkey? You look at, we're looking at verses 6 to 10 here. Just look at it and give me your opinion. What, what do you think he's saying? Why did it? And you could also ask, how did he stop them? But that's a question perhaps we can't answer, really, because we're not told. But why did the Holy Spirit forbid Paul? Well, he wanted them to go to Macedonia. Yeah. Why didn't the Holy Spirit just tell him that? <laughs> <laughs> why didn't the Holy Spirit speak to him and say, Paul, go to Macedonia? Why, is, um, why are the apostles, um, if you like, trying to work out what is God's will? Any, any suggestions, any thoughts? It's a very difficult question you're posing because it ties in with verse 7 as well. Verse 7, yep. They tried to enter there as well, and okay. <laughs> so we've got, a, we've got a double whammy. <laughs> we have, brother. We have indeed. We have indeed. And then we've got the third bit where, in effect, he gets a vision, doesn't he? I think, really... Isn't this like... Sorry, go on. I was going to say something. Go on, James. That this is life's story, isn't it? God doesn't always give it to us on a plane. Yeah. Why do you think that is, James? Why? Yeah. Because we need to get to know God. It, okay. And what else, John, do you think, James? You trust him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here's the mighty apostle. Did he have a clear... A clear he wanted to go one way, but God had it other intentions, didn't he? I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure some of us here can talk of experiences where we felt God called us to do something and actually it, nothing happened. Yeah, and, and that's right, actually, Nicholas, because what you're saying, this is brilliant, actually, because it's like he gives him clear direction, but also tells him where not to go. And sometimes, hmm. actually, and, you know, I've experienced my life, it's more a case of where God tells you not to go, which is the leading, than actually where you go. And... And because of where Paul thought he wanted to go, God sort of said, no, I'm going to forbid you doing that and you're not going to go to Turkey. And now this is where I want you to go. Do you know what I mean? So, but he got the confirmation. It wasn't just saying you go to Macedonia. I think if he'd had that dream in just itself, he'd have been really unsure. But he was unsure. He was less unsure because God had already closed the doors mm. of other places that he thought he was going to go to. Yes. So it... it it pulls together the whole thing almost. and sometimes we don't just do things on the will, the will of the spirit just on one thing we test it out but we test it out in other things you know yeah. it's just just thought about it yeah. thank you for that paul and don't you think it, it's really showing us very importantly the need for dependence on god and to yes. listen and sometimes we don't get a clear answer brothers and sisters 
Yeah. yeah. If, you know, if you know the stories of some of the great missionaries, they wanted to go one place, God sent them into another place. I mean, the famous Christian missionary, William Carey, the father of modern mission, as you know, wanted to go to India eventually. He had an incredibly difficult time getting to India. They stopped yeah. him. The um, East India Dock Company refused to let him go on a ship because they knew he was going to go as a missionary. And so if we think we know what God's will is, sometimes we don't. And I think what the, the Lord is teaching us is that we need to be dependent on him. Paul was uh, an incredibly overdriven man. You know, he was just, in some sense, he was just go for it. And God was showing him, you've got to wait. And sometimes as Christians, we need to wait. You may have big ideas for your church or for your Christian ministry. It may not be God's intention. Some of you perhaps be waiting for some great event that's going to happen, that's going to change your life. It may not happen. God may have other plans for you. And what's incredible is his disappointment turned out to be God's appointment, as my friend Steve Brady always says. Yeah, our disappointment is his appointment. This was actually the most significant turn in his missionary journey. Did you know that? Yeah. God called him to Europe. Can I make a comment there, Nicholas? Yes, Father. Who's that? I can't remember who's speaking now. Who's... Yeah, it's Peter. Okay, go on, Peter. To yeah, find... um, <laughs> it, it... <laughs> The question you're posing is a very difficult one, but I would suggest to you and to the listeners that it may have something to do with Paul's attunement. The, the, the text implies that Paul is day by day in tune with the Lord. Yes. And that attunement to the will of God makes it very clear which way he is to go. Yes, And it possibly says something about us that in our very busy Western lives, we're not fully attuned to the spirit. That's, that's a very helpful point. Yeah, so. for that. Um, yes. And I, I think also, I was just going to make a point that not all of us are called to be missionaries, by the way, in terms of being sent out or to be evangelists. But we're all called to be witnesses of the gospel. And I think you know, people shouldn't do mission work unless they feel a sense of calling. Now, how do you know your calling? Number one, there is an inner conviction by the Spirit. Number two, either elders or mature Christians will affirm to you perhaps God's calling on your life. And occasionally, sometimes God does speak through visions and dreams. So we mustn't negate these supernatural experiences, okay? Because they are, you know, you need to look at the Great Awakening and the Great Revivals. I mean, even Lloyd-Jones had a supernatural awakening of the Holy Spirit which transformed his ministry. So we see here finally this vision of Paul saying that they felt God was calling them to Europe. Can I just show you in these verses the Trinitarian work of God? Just look at this. So if you look at verse, um, verse 6, it says what? That they were kept by the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? Yeah. Look at verse 7. Read the second half of verse. It says, look, but the Spirit of Jesus. You notice that? So we've got there already, God the Holy Spirit, we've got God the Son, and right at the end, verse 10, concluding that God, Fios in Greek, had called us to preach the gospel to them. God the Father. I just thought that was quite interesting, really, wasn't it? The work mm -hmm. of God there, the, the Spirit, the Son, the Son, and God the Father himself. Mm -hmm. Yes? So do you mm -hmm. see how... I think there's also the point, I God. think there's also the point here that God had a different plan for Asia and Bithynia for someone else to go there. As we see in 1 Peter 1 verse 1, the chosen are scattered about Pontius, Galatia, Asia and Bithynia. Yes. So it wasn't that Asia and Bithynia were out of God's plan, but that there were somebody else was uh, in it was God's plan that somebody else should do that work. Yes, and I think you. that uh, tells us something today as well. Yes, that's a very good point. Thank you for that. But it's the key thing, isn't it? It's always the Holy Spirit that leads us individually as Christians, whether it's work related, whether it's spiritual work related, or whether it's the church related, we must seek God, the Holy Spirit's wisdom and guidance. But notice how they, it says they concluded. 
In other words, they had to work it out, Paul and Silas. They said they concluded. So they used reason and logic and the, the evidence that God had called them. Yes, they weren't robots. They weren't like, you know, and sort of demonized where they just went wherever the spirit called them, like, like um, you know, automatic machines. <laughs> they had will, but they submitted their will to God, the Holy Spirit's will. So we're a spirit-led church, yes? And we're a spirit-led people. So it goes on the, on the back of what you've just outlined. Yes. Verse 11 is a corollary of the whole argument. When you read, and I'm speaking here as a sailor. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Th Summer Thrace. Yes. That means in their sailing ship, they weren't tacking against the wind. They were running in front of the wind and they were making a straight course from A to B. Nothing hindered them. They were in the will of God. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, thank you for that. That's a, a, an interesting um, uh, angle on it, actually. Thank you for that input. So we've dealt with one to 10. Should we go to verses 11 to 34 now? Am I doing okay for time? It's 10 to, 10 to nine so far. Yes, yeah, sure. no problem. Okay. So let's look at verses 11 to 34 now. Now conversion by the Spirit. Okay. So that's why I say if you can break it up, it makes it much more manageable, the passage. So we see here uh, that they arrived eventually in Philippi. It was called Philippi, as you know, because of Philip of Macedon, um, Alexander the Great's father. And it was a very important Roman colony. So there were lots of, of Romans living there. And... <clears throat> To be a Roman citizen, as Paul was from birth and Silas, gave you extraordinary privileges. In particularly, you had free travel, all right? Um, what was also exceptional is that God used a pagan empire for God's purposes. If you put it in its context, how can missionaries go to all the known world and speak one language and everybody understands it, which was Greek? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Romans gave us roads, they gave us law, they gave order, and you had easy passage to all these countries under Roman rule. Extraordinary. And it was a time of great peace in the Roman Empire because they subdued all their enemies. That's why Paul could travel so freely. And if you were a Roman citizen, you could never be flogged without a proper trial. It was illegal. Secondly, you wouldn't be executed with, with a crucifixion. You were granted... Um, to appeal to Rome, which meant you went before Caesar effectively. So we'll, it will make sense when we get to that bit. So let's look at these three, these three um, conversions, so to speak, here. So let's look at Lydia, verses 11 onwards. Now, Lydia was um, lived in Turkey, as you know, because she's from a place called Thyatira. And it will be on that map. I think it's on that map somewhere. And it was well, it was well known to be producers of purple cloth, which was very expensive cloth. In fact, she was a very wealthy businesswoman. Mm -hmm. And she clearly came to Philippi to sell her wares. But what's interesting, in Thyatira, there was a Jewish colony there. So she was clearly influenced by the Jewish people. And that's why it says she was a woman who, who worshipped God. Doesn't mean she was converted, but she clearly feared the God of the Jewish people. And so this is, that's the setting. Out of interest, how many Jewish men do you need to have a synagogue? Ten. Oh. Ten. Yes, that's right. So in this setting in Philippi, there weren't many Jews, were there? Because they had to meet by a river on the Sabbath. That's why Paul went to the place where they met to pray. And, do, and so if that's why she goes there and Paul goes to them. Now, look what it says. <clears throat> it says they sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. And it says uh, the Lord opened her heart to respond to God's message. So, was there any supernatural act that caused Lydia to be converted? Yes. It yeah, was. So the spirit opened the heart. <laughs> yeah, but what I'm saying, it wasn't an external sign and wonder, was it, uh, Greg? No, it wasn't an external sign and wonder. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, yeah, it has to come from God. We yes. cannot, we can't believe by 
by ourselves, even however much we want to. Yes. Has that seed of regeneration planted. Yes. What was interesting with her, she clearly had some teaching by either the Jewish people in Thyatira, because then the Lord opened her heart. So she was already a woman that had been prepared, if you like, by the Holy Spirit before she even got to Philippi and met Paul. And God converts her by the Holy Spirit. And do you notice afterwards what happened? Read on from verse 15. Somebody read it out. No, me read it out for me. <clears throat> you got it? Oh, don't worry then. Okay. So no, 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 got it, got it. Verse 15. Yeah. Did you say? Yes. Verse 15. Um, when she and the members of her household were baptised, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she yeah. persuaded us. Yeah. Isn't it? yeah, so do we see immediately she was baptised. So there wasn't a sort of a, 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 a discipleship course in baptism before. <laughs> they all got baptised. And without being wanting to dwell on it too much, when it talks about households, it doesn't necessarily mean like we perceive a household like me my wife and my four children households there would have incorporated slaves servant extended family members grandparents maybe uncles so it was a big affair and clearly it was those who responded to it and got baptized and do you notice there is always this immediate response for hospitality afterwards and i think there's something wonderful about the spirit when it converts people there is a longing for, for, for wanting to show that love and joy with other Christians. And she was very, very joyful by bringing them to her house and saying, stay with me. And she was clearly a formidable woman because we noticed right at the end that the church was actually in Lydia's house. So, and uh, the, 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 um, the inflection in that word, and she persuaded us, <laughs> literally means she would not take no for an answer. Absolutely. She wasn't British, was she, James? She didn't say, come out for a cup of tea. She said, come <laughs> out for tea. <laughs> <laughs> I always, this joke aside, when I, you know, you go to a new church and they, and they usually say, oh, nice to see you. I feel like saying, so when am I coming around for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Lord Jesus told um, uh, uh, that he, is. he was going to come to his house for, for lunch. So he was very forthright, the Lord. OK, so we see there that wonderful conversion of Lydia. And now we see these other two people who are converted. So we've got this very wealthy woman. She's the top of, top of society in terms of her aristocracy, if you like. And now we've got the other end of the spectrum. The person is really on the bottom rung of the ladder, this demonized real spiritualist woman this this slave who was demon possessed and and soothsaying effectively so if we see that uh where are we now what's what have i missed i've missed i'm getting confused now where are we with the lady hang on uh where are we now uh, yes here we are verses 16 now so we see the slave girl now why did paul in verse 18 get annoyed with her was he, was he angry with her because she, she was irritating him? Why do you think he was annoyed? So she was basically saying, these people are declaring to us the way of the Most High God. A bit like the demons when Jesus cast them out. So why did Paul get annoyed? Surely he was annoyed with the demon, not with the girl. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. I think he was, he could see her torment. So that's why in his, in his, in his, in his, in, in his, indignant anger he, he cast it out you know in the name of the lord and she was set free from that and you notice he said in the name of jesus christ he's not using his own authority he's using the authority of the lord jesus as an apostle to come out of her and so we see this account very quickly of um paul and silas actually uh getting beaten up effectively and getting attacked um why did the apostles not use their, their right as a Roman citizen? Because if you notice, they're not they actually flogged them. And it was actually illegal to flog a Roman citizen without a trial. You could be executed for, for such a serious offence. Why didn't they call out? Because God wanted that jailer saved. <laughs> James, I like it. 
<laughs> so here's an interesting challenge. Do we, do we thank God for the opposition that we get as Christians? Mm. Well, we're supposed to, us, yes. Sorry? We're supposed to. We're supposed to count trials all joy. <laughs> yeah. That's very easy. That's maybe, Paul, right. maybe Paul had that in mind. That's right, Greg. So, I mean, it may have been that they didn't get the opportunity to, to use their Roman right, because they use it later. Either because they didn't get hurt, they weren't, they weren't being heard by the crowd because they were just yeah. riotous. Yeah. Yeah. Or, as you rightly said, perhaps the Lord permitted it so, and I think your point is actually a very valid one, that God is totally in control of our lives. The Holy Spirit works in us and through us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. Never think the Lord has left you when you're going through some terrible dark time. Often in those terrible dark times, the Lord is closer to you than you'll ever, ever imagine. Yeah? Nicholas, yes, I'm a little bit concerned about this verse 17 and its implications today Go on, then. read it where is that verse 17 this girl followed paul and the rest of us shouting these men are the servants of the most high god who are telling you the way to be saved mm -hmm. and so on and she's speaking truth yes yes and yet she's demonic yeah don't forget you see that even the demons said to uh, they it, what happened to the man in the gadarenes john yeah at the point I'm being, I'm, I know the history. It's the application and the implication okay. for today. Yes. God even uses demonic forces for his own purposes. And so even the demons are under the Lord's divine authority. So they don't know everything, but they have a degree of truth. Not that they know what, some, what the truth is that Jesus is the divine son of God. I just want to finish my point. Please do, John. So often today... We have people who are preaching a truth mm -hmm. and they're telling you something that is true in a church, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's blessed of God. So often we have seen people speaking a truth and it's good to the ears, but is not necessarily about honoring jesus it's yes. about and you know where i'm going on this with some some people who manipulate the truth with choirs and and vast churches and it finishes up you putting in your hand in your pocket and sending them money and they're building an empire mm -hmm. which and that's why it's important that we are able to discern the signs of the times like the sons of Hezekiah but also to have discernment of the spirit, to be able to discern spirits and take the risk of rebuking those of repute who seem to be of God but are not. Because if we don't, many will be deceived. Yes, that's a very, that's a very valid point. Does anybody that, else want to comment that, on that? That's the, that's the risk that Paul takes. Um, I think the, the, some of them, they call it a familiar spirit where he uses certain knowledge, yes, a, a little bit of a truth just to woo you. But if the root and then if the seed um, or the result, if there's not, the rest of them doesn't confirm with the word of God, you're just going to have to be careful. It's not every spoken word. I suppose what John is saying is that every spoken word doesn't necessarily mean that it's coming from God. You right. need to look at the bigger picture. Mm. So, and, and that's where Jesus alludes to that many will, did you not do this in your name, Lord? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Yeah. And the Lord says, depart from me. I know you not. You workers of iniquity. Yes, yes. So I think the, the key thing is clearly, uh, you know, Jesus says, by their fruits, you will know them. So, yes, there's always going to be the force, even within the church. Sorry, someone saying something there? Sorry. Yes. So, John, yes, there's always going to be the fake. People will say words that sound correct, but actually their lifestyle is far from the gospel. And I think one has to not only hear the words, but see their lifestyle and see yeah. how they're living. It has to be a really, a really good counterfeit to work. 
Yes, John. I mean, as an ex-spiritualist, I tell you now, I've seen supernatural phenomenon that, you know, healings, etc. So it doesn't mean all healings are demonic, but the devil can replicate and people have had experiences. And I, I, I've had many experiences through, you know, even the Lord spoke once through my satanic yoga meditation. When I wasn't a Christian, God spoke to me once through it. So God can use these these wicked things for his own purpose. Look at Balaam. Yeah, yep. God used that demonic false prophet who spoke God's word when God commanded him to. But then God there's destroyed something, him. There's, there's something significant about this verse 17 for me, though. So, Paul, they're just saying about what makes this actually untruth. And the subtlety is, it says, these men, servants of the Most High God, proclaiming to us the way of salvation. Now, that's a truth, but it's a distortion of truth because... When we talk about salvation, we talk about our own salvation when we share testimony. Not that, so the truth is there, but there is no testimony of this, what this woman is saying. And this is where Paul perceived in the spirit that she wasn't talking from herself, was that it talked about us, not what the spirit has brought salvation to me. Yes. Now, and, and, it's, and it's really interesting, actually, for me, because that is such a, a sort of an example of of a lie of the devil which turning things around you know we know in in you know in luke, you know luke where and where satan tempts jesus and he turns scripture and this is the same sort of thing and i, I just think wow paul discerned this yes incredibly well because yes. and the subtlety with this they are proclaiming to us well they are because they are proclaiming truth but actually she's commenting without actually speaking herself yes and in my experience actually i've come across somebody who followed us around or followed people around as a believer but clearly was not and and actually and spoke the truth to the point but actually they weren't and that subtlety is actually something which is and paul's discernment here is absolutely incredible because he's clearly discerned that what she's speaking is a lie not that what the words themselves are a lie, they're truth, actually, they've come to proclaim salvation. But well, the way it's being said, the context is the lie. Well, God spoke powerfully to Paul with this, I think. But this is interesting as well, isn't it, John? Before we just move on, is that the owners didn't want to listen to Paul, did they? They didn't want to listen to, the, to their slave girl because they lost their income. So they, they were more concerned about their income than knowing about the truth. Because had they actually wanted to listen, they would have perhaps sought Paul and found out but they didn't they put him into prison instead but I think for the sake of the time I think we should move on but thank you for those valid those valid comments and reflections on that so last I just want to look at the jailer which is always the, the big one here um just to put it into its context so we've got the, the Lydia who was converted very silently so to speak just with Paul teaching her and explaining the gospel and the spirit opened her eyes this supernatural event where this this slave girl is set free and then after being flogged in prison. Now look at verse 25. Here's a question. How on earth can we pray, sing psalms, all right, when we've just been virtually flogged to death? How is it conceivable to be full of this extreme joy when you've gone through some terrible, I mean, those floggings would have been awful. Yeah. You know, it would have torn your flesh. How is it possible, brothers and sisters? Can we humanly do that? No. Do, do, do you think that this is a function of the fact that these two men were so close to the Lord that even in a stinking Roman prison, they knew his presence? I think you've touched on a point. When you're led by the Spirit and doing God's will, God gives you supernatural power and joy in times of severe hardship. Why do you think when the church suffers the most, it grows the most? They used to say of the church in, in you know, the Christians in the, in the first century, they died well because they'll be praising hymns as they go to the gladiator ring and the lions go and kill their kids and they're praising mm. Jesus as they're being eaten. Yeah. You mm. can't humanly do it. It's supernatural. We are not only led by the spirit, we are converted by the Spirit, and the Spirit in times of great struggle will give you supernatural power 
to endure the trial that God puts you through. It's not humanly possible. Don't ever try to think you can cope with it. You cannot. It's dependent on the Holy Spirit that will provide for all your needs. That's the only way. That's why it says in Thessalonians, they know, full of joy, joy unspeakable. And they were going through terrible persecution in Thessalonica. This is how the apostles did. It was of the Holy Spirit. Now, take comfort in that. Don't be fearful of perhaps you're going for something or something's going to happen to you and you're fearful. Put your trust in him and rest in Christ and cast your cares on him for he cares for you. He knows what you're able to bear and he will never let you be tempted beyond what you can cope with. Does that make sense? Yeah, but it just add as well, perhaps. As well as being close to God, they put themselves far away from the world, from all its attractions, and therefore they're, they're less less likely to be bothered by its distractions like this here. You know, they've 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 left the world behind, and just like those Christians in the, the amphitheatres, they were looking into the joy that was set before them. Yeah, I think that's, I think the danger of that, though, Greg, is that we separate super Christian, those that are dedicated full time to the gospel and us ordinaries who are working full time. We have a calling as individual Christians, wherever we are, whether you're retired, whether you're infirm at home, you've got a calling. And you need to ask God what that calling is. Some are prayer warriors, some are, some are givers, some are servants, some are prayerful, you know, some are teachers. We all have an important calling. And with that, there's a cost to the calling. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves the question, are we ready for the cost of being a Christian, of being sold out for the gospel? Because if you are, I'll guarantee you, there will be opposition. It's interesting, you know, because that verse in, in the church in the, in the West and where we live now, we, we read this with some sort of almost um, sort of frivolity, really, because we're thinking what's going on. But actually, when you look at, organizations like open doors and the church mm -hmm. the persecuted church mm -hmm. this is a lived experience yeah. and the joy that's often in the persecuted church is 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 strong it's it's, it's there do you know what i mean so that's fine. so this is an example of that really to be honest yeah and by the way references are on my notes it's one Thessalonians 167 if you want to see about their joy but we'll move on could you just notice because i'm very conscious of the time now it's just gone quarter past nine nearly um there was this incredible earthquake this is a supernatural event here now okay this is the spectacular so we've already had the the, the slave girl supernaturally healed now we've got this violent earthquake which releases all the chains and the poor the poor philippian jailer who by the way was probably a retired military officer He's a bit like middle class, you know, he's retired, it's his retirement job. He's doing his bit. <laughs> and, um, and he would have killed himself because to, uh, to be a Roman jailer, if they, you're, you're, you're ex if they escape your prisoners, you're going to get killed. You'll get executed. So he was going to kill himself. And Paul thankfully stops him. And this lovely account in verse 29, which is the thing we love to hear from people. What must I do to be saved? <laughs> he clearly was so petrified but notice he wasn't converted by the miracle it wasn't the earthquake that converted him if you read on it says look they replied, believe in the lord jesus and you will be saved it's always jesus that's the focus the lord jesus okay and and he says look and they spoke look at that then they spoke the word of the lord to him this is verse 31 32 and to all the others in his house <clears throat> notice it's a household and they're speaking the word of God to them, to those who could understand. So that if they're relatively young, if you can understand the gospel, you can respond to it. And it says that night they basically washed, he washed their clothes, their wounds. And he said they were all baptized, the whole household. And notice again, fellowship. They had food afterwards. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. Isn't that a fantastic response? This man was so grateful to God, he cleaned the wounds of those apostles and he, he fed them a meal and they were baptized. So, so you see that context, these three people from, if you like, the extremes of society, from the most wealthiest Lydia, who was converted just through Paul speaking to her. You then have the, 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 the woman who was demonically, demonically possessed, the slave girl, who was basically the lowest of the low, who was deemed worthless in society. God converted her supernaturally by taking the demon out. And you have this Philippian jailer who's a bit like a middle-class retiree. And um, 
again, this spectacular earthquake, but it was Paul and Silas explaining the gospel to them, the Lord Jesus, that brought him to a living faith. And that's a wonderful uh, revelation of how when a person's converted, there is this desire to be with other people, as we've seen in the last few verses. And can I perhaps ask a question? How much hospitality do we practice you know, amongst other, other fellow Christians? Because it seems to be here in the early church, it was a very common thing to do, predominantly because the church was in people's houses. Uh, do we struggle with hospitality? Go on. Before COVID, <laughs> our mode of life was to have an open door. Lovely, James. Very yes, important. Exactly. Isn't it? Nobody can contradict me. That is our manner of life. Good for you. I'm very pleased to hear that. I'm very pleased to hear that. Well, look, we better just move on now so we can bring it to an end. So there's those three, the, the, uh, the three um, conversions. Just to, just to finish off those last verses, notice in verse 37, Paul now uses his Roman status. <laughs> and I would say, why does he use it here out of interest? Because the Lord allowed him clearly to use it right at this bit where they want him to go. And he says, no, I'm not going to go without, without making a, a, a bit of noise, really. Do you think he's been a bit vindictive, um, Paul and Silas? No. No. I think he's trying to protect his spiritual children. I think that's absolutely right, brother. I think that's one of the main reasons. Yeah. I think it's to stop the church being hindered. And if you read the book of Philippians, by the way, this is the context. Read the book of Philippians and you'll see it all where he talks about their suffering and their joy in the Lord. And yes, I think it was not only to allow him to carry on, but equally for the church not to be hindered because they were so petrified of Paul now and Silas that they think we better not do anything to, to, you know, for him to then go back to the Rome and complain about us because they'll get probably executed for attacking. And he emphasizes that in verse 40, he goes, um, to Lydia's house so That's that they would they would know their prayers had been answered <laughs> they've been praying they would have been encouraged but also the magistrates now know you touch Lydia's house or Lydia's house church you got a problem <laughs> that's right John that's right and you've led me nicely into the last bit so we talked about led by the spirit fellowship by the spirit and the last verse is is, is um, sorry, conversion by the Spirit, and the last bit is fellowship by the Spirit, 35 to 40, which is those we sort of touched on it already. And as I think you've almost touched on it, really, is that, uh, as you said, as, after Paul and Silas came out of the prison, it says in verse 40, they went to Lydia's house. So she was clearly very wealthy, she had a big house, and she practiced hospitality. The Greek word for fellowship, by the way, is kononia, okay? And people wrongly assume Colonia or you know, is just communion. No, it isn't. It's more than that. It's far deeper. And the greatest colonia amongst believers is a persecuted church. Did you know that? Just like here. And you see later on, if you look at the churches, when they were going through terrible suffering, the fellowship amongst believers was incredible. People noticed that the pagans, that his love that Christians had for each other. They cared for their widows. They cared for each other. And they cared for the poor outside the church. But here, and more than likely, it would have been a Philippian jailer at Lydia's house because it was the church that was started in her house. Doesn't mean she led it. It would have been also the slave girl more than likely would have been there. And they're gathering together. You see, it's the spirit that brings people, Christians together. Yeah. Don't have false fellowship with non-believers. They've, you know, unfortunately, what the problem with traditional churches is that you're all included until you're excluded, aren't you? Whereas in a non-conformist, you're all excluded until you're included, as my friend always tells us. But, you know, true Christian fellowship, regardless of your denomination, is do they love the Lord Jesus Christ? Are they born again of the Holy Spirit? Is there evidence of godliness? And it's those what unite Christians. It's Christ Jesus, regardless of what you are, because Christ is what unites Christians, regardless of status, of rank, of wealth, of position. We are all one in Christ because it's the spirit that brings fellowship among believers. And on that point, I'm going to stop. Amen.